And God said, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures And let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and then God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them and God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Thus begins the story of creation in Genesis. But what are we to make of it? Did it actually happen? Or is this a religious myth? What do you think? Was this just one more religious musing of some ancient people, or is it the very word of God? Does this story disprove evolution, or does evolution disprove this story? What are we to make of this? Well, there are many opinions, right? There are many, many opinions about the first chapters of Genesis. In fact, I would say the first three chapters of Genesis and what they mean are more argued about than any other religious document in the history of the world. There's more debate about these few pages than almost anything else. Like most hotly contested issues that humans like to argue about, When it comes to opinions, what we see in this is a bell curve. So what we find is we have people with very strong and passionate opinions at one extreme and people with very strong and passionate opinions on the other side. Think about politics, think about social issues, think about morality. And the problem is, it's not that always being in the middle is right, right? Because a lot of times being a Christian is going to look extreme. No, that's not the truth I want you to get. The truth I want you to get is in almost every situation, the people at the extremes always claim you have to choose between them and the other extreme. And that's very rarely the case. The same is true when it comes to how to understand the creation story in Genesis. So at one extreme are what are called young earth creationists, and at the other extreme are called atheistic evolutionists. So the young earth creationists say, I read Genesis as a science textbook and I interpret it literally and so God literally created the entire universe in seven earth days, exactly as it's told. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe in the authority of scripture and you're really an atheist and you really don't love God. 
And then you have people in the other extreme, the atheistic evolutionist, who says, oh, no, no. Science proves that Genesis is just a bunch of religious myths. Science proves there is no God. And if you don't agree with us, that means you are a dumb, unthinking fundamentalist who doesn't believe in science. Well, neither of those are true. When it comes to how Genesis and scientific evolutionary theory go together, there's actually a huge continuum of beliefs along that curve. So there's young earth creationists, and old earth, and figure out where you are in this. An old earth creationist would say, the scripture says that to the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, so I believe in a literal step-by-step creation, but it was over millions of years or thousands of years or whatever God wanted it to be. Intelligent design people say, don't even look at the scripture. Let's just look at the world, look at the design of the world. We don't believe that evolutionary theory can account for everything we see here. It's not that we don't believe there are evolutionary processes. We just don't think they're enough to explain everything that we see here, this incredible design. A theistic evolutionist will say, I believe that God in his sovereignty chose to use evolution to do exactly what he wanted to do. An agnostic evolutionist would say, well, whether God exists or not, evolutionary process does the same thing either way, and so it doesn't really matter if God exists or not. I don't, I don't care. I'm not even thinking about that. And then an atheistic evolutionist, as we said, will say, oh, no, this proves there is no God. So there's this very wide span of understandings, and I think that both young earth creationists and atheistic evolutionists do violence to the text when they try to use it for their own agenda to read out what they're interested in rather than asking, why was this written? And what was it trying to say? And what was the main point? And most importantly, the key to that is, how would someone 4,000 years ago have understood this text? Because it came to them first. It had to make sense to them 4,000 years ago. Now, I happen to have my own theory about the first couple chapters of Genesis. I want you to hear this. This is just the world according to Langdon. I might be wrong. Maybe somebody else has thought this too, but I want to tell you what I've come to, and I hope it will help you. And here's how I start that. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a revelation from the Lord? Have you ever had a word of knowledge? Amen, sister. Have you ever had an image that God was showing you something about the future. Even if you haven't, you can get a sense of what that is like by looking at people in the Bible who did have visions from God. And what we see, what we see when we kind of step back is that a lot, they have a lot of things in common. First, it's usually very impressionistic. Like you're given an image or a vision or a scene to help you understand. Second, um, it, it gives you a sense of sequence, like wh- how things are going to end up or, or where they're flowing. And what happens is time is usually telescoped. So here's what I mean by that. Imagine a long telescope with a bunch of lenses. If you collapse it, they're still in the same sequence, but the dis- distance between them gets compressed. And so the one from here to here might represent a day, and the next one might represent a thousand years. You're like It's just compressed because what matters is not the amount of time it's the sequence so i've never seen you know a prophecy that says in 12.7 years blah no it's more like after a season this and finally most visions always return you to the sovereignty of god like when god gives you that kind of blessing you're reminded of the sovereignty of god that god is at work and he has a plan well Imagine what it would be like to be a man 4,000 years ago who asks God for a vision. He wants to know. He's looking around at the world, and he wants to know, how did this get here? Why is it all here? How did I get here? How did it all begin? Why are things the way they are? Now, again, try and imagine someone 4,000 years ago, like a Bedouin shepherd, except no sense of, Technology, no internet, no phones, of course, no science, no sense of atoms or cells or quarks or supernovas, no, just what they can see with, with their own eyes. What would a really wise, smart person 4,000 years ago think just looking out at the world? I'll tell you what I think they would think. They'd go, well, I'm old enough now that I see that there are seasons and the seasons 
come and they come and they come and people grow up and they have kids and then they die and their children grow up and have kids and then they die. It's a cycle. It's the circle of life. It would be very natural to conclude the earth has always been here, the earth will always be here, and it's just this repeating circle forever. That would make sense. But imagine this guy who loved God asked the Lord to give him a vision of what actually happened and what is happening. Well, how would an infinite God who created quarks and quantum theory and black holes and celestial, how would that God reveal the creation of the universe to a almost prehistoric man who only knows what he sees around him? Well, God would give him visions that would make sense to him to explain it which is exactly what he did. And here's the beauty. It still rings true today. I actually believe the first few chapters are a gift from God, a revelation, a vision. And more than that, I'm going to tell you, I believe the first few chapters of Genesis are a miracle. I mean, the actual text is a miracle that is unexplainable. Why do I say that? Think about creation that you've gotten really used to hearing if you've grown up in church. Now listen to other creation myths from the same time. So how were other people thinking about the creation of the world at that time? Here's one. The world began with a giant and a giant cow that emerged from the thaw. So the world was frozen. It unthawed. They came out. Then the cow licked the god Bor and his wife into being. The couple gave birth to Buri, who fathered three sons. The sons rose up and killed the giant, and then from his corpse, they created the world. So from his flesh, they created the earth. From them, from uh, his bones, they created the mountains. From his hair, they created the trees. And rivers and seas and lakes came from his blood. Or, or here's another creation myth of the time. The chaos goose and the chaos gander produced an egg that was the sun. Or here's another one. The world is supported by four elephants standing on a giant turtle. Now, compare those myths to the first words of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a revelation. This is a vision. It's saying that God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. God is not part of the creation. There was no creation. There was no physical world. And God said, let it be, and then it was. So it came from nothing, out of nothing, something. It's unbelievable. Now, focus on the rest of Genesis. You know, when you think about it, At a time when people thought the world was supported by a turtle held up by four elephants, at a time when people assumed that the seasons on earth always were and always would be, this declares, no, time is not a permanent circle. It is a spiral in a particular direction. In other words, time is linear. There's a beginning and a middle and an end. Therefore, There's meaning and purpose, and your life is in the middle of a story being told that has a beginning and a middle and an end. This was revolutionary. And at a time when those people in different cultures had their own ways of trying to understand how things began, listen to six implications from Genesis and compare them to what modern astronomy and biology tell us. First, it says that, number one, the universe was created in an instant, with a word. Something came out of nothing, big bang. Second, the first thing created was energy. First command you heard was, let there be light. Third, life began in the water and then moved to land. Fourth, life appeared first as vegetation, and after that, animals appeared. Fifth, fish and birds appeared before mammals, and sixth, that man was at the end of the chain of creation after basic elements and vegetation and fish and birds and mammals. How do you explain this? How in the world do you explain some guy 4,000 years ago, practically prehistoric, no sense of science, saying this is how the world began? Because God gave it to him as a gift, as a vision, to understand this this is what happened and this is where you fit in it. 
And it's the exact same thing that he gives to us. Life is more than random events driven by thermodynamic properties. There's something much bigger going on here. Now, if you grew up in church, you may know that Genesis actually has two creation stories. Two. Yeah. Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-3. And then listen to Genesis 2-4. It says this. This is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created. Well, why would there be two different accounts of the creation of the world? Well, consider this guy. Can we go to the next slide? Check that guy out. Don't you love chameleons? Look at those two eyes. They're like, I don't know how his brain does it, but he's seeing two different images at the same time. So it's one world, but he's seeing two different sides of the same world at the same time. That's what these two stories are doing. These two different stories are two different ways of looking at the creation. The first is telling, the first is like focusing on how this world came to be, and it's focused on physical objects appearing in time. The second is about relationships. The second creation story focuses on our relationship with God, and it focuses on persons in relation to God. So listen to how it goes on in verse 7 of chapter 2. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So it's very intimate. God's breathing. It's it's personal. It's close. And it says he's made of dust, but not just dust. He's made of dust and the breath of life. The breath of life is not material. If you've seen a live person who dies, if you've been with a dead person, you know A dead person is very different than a live person. It's dust, it's matter, plus the breath of life, which is not material. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to work and take care of it. So even though they're in paradise, there's work. Even though they're in paradise, there's responsibilities. Take care. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. Because work is good. Because having responsibilities is good, and it reflects our very creator when we have those things. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So in paradise, there's already morals and rules. God commanded, like command. It's a rule. Don't break the rule. This is a real world, It's a physical world, so therefore there's real consequences. The very gravity that allows you to dance and to run and have joy will break your neck if you don't use it right. So therefore, don't eat that tree. That's bad for you. I don't want you to get hurt. Now, verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and he felt no shame. So think about the relationship between the sexes. No shame. Can you imagine this? Try and imagine this. Absolutely no shame about your body, no shame about your looks, no shame about your finances, no shame about your ability, no shame about your intelligence. You're in paradise, and you're working, and you have responsibilities, and it's a garden of delights. Now, imagine that scene, and imagine someone else looking at those two people in that scene. Imagine what a spiteful envious person would think of two people in that scene chapter 3 verse 1 now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals and we find out in revelation that by serpent it means the devil calls him the old serpent and notice it's it's separating the serpent from all the wild animals like it's a different category he said to the woman did god really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, he knows that's not what God said, but he's trying to mess her up. Why the image of a snake? Do you know why? Because a snake is a shapeshifter. One minute a snake looks like this. The next minute it looks like that. It appears one way one minute, another way another minute. And you know what? It It can disappear almost instantly. All it needs is a little hole. Just like the evil one. He appears one way one minute, He appears another way, another minute. And what does he do? He starts with a question, and this is what he does to us. 
And what he's basically saying is, how could God keep any good thing from you if he really loves you? Which is exactly how he tempts us today. How could God keep any good thing from you if he really loves you? This is a prophecy. It's prophesying exactly what you and I experienced today. 4,000 years ago it said, this is how it works, this is how it will work, and here we are today experiencing the very same kinds of things. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, he replies, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what's he do? He lies first, you will never die, so he's a liar. And second, he tries to get their attention off all the things that God gave them. It's like God's saying, you can have every other tree, there's a bazillion of them, just not this one. And he gets them to focus on what they can't have instead of all that they do have. Isn't that just like us? Just like us. And he says that when, because God's trying to rip you off. God is trying to rip you off. Isn't it when we really want something and we know God doesn't want us to have it, we think he's ripping us off? Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and ate it. Why wouldn't you? Look at all those benefits. Why wouldn't you eat it? There's only one reason. Because God said don't. How are your temptations? I'll tell you what happens to me. All the lawyers in my head give me 8 million reasons why it's okay for me to get my, what I want. And in the end, there's only one voice saying don't. The only reason not to do it is because God says don't do it. She also gave some to her husband. Men, don't try and blame this on the women. They're both completely equally guilty as comes out here. She's not the seductress. It's both of them being knuckleheads. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then both of their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So what happens here? We see that this disobedience, this willful, informed choice to revolt against the will of God, the act that we call the original sin, what comes in with it? Shame. Shame. They saw and knew things they were not capable of handling as finite beings, and it broke their hearts. But it's not just shame that was born in that moment. Verse 17 goes on, And to Adam God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Verse 18, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. They fell from innocence to shame, They fell from working in a garden to toiling among thorns and thistles. The whole creation became damaged and would be further damaged with further generations. They are alienated from each other, man and woman. They are alienated from the creation. They are alienated from God. They have fallen from their previous glory. This is what we mean when we talk about the fall of man. And when you hear me say, we live in a fallen world, What I mean is this, it still echoes the goodness, like God created it and it was good. When you look out at the world, you still see some of that original goodness and beauty there, but now it's also full of brokenness and disease and human arrogance and human violence and human self-righteousness. See, this is a revelation. This explains to us why the world is such a mixed bag. There's there's so much good and there's so much evil. There's creativity and there's life-sucking toil. It explains why people are such a mixed bag. Sometimes they act like angels, other times they act like devils. You see, there's no conflict between a belief in God and a belief in science. There's no conflict between a belief in science and this story of Genesis. But here's the thing. 
It's really good. I, I'm glad about it. It helps me understand, okay, there is a story. I'm in it. There's a middle, beginning, end, and, I, and I'm digging this, and it, and it explains a lot about life, but it's not too hopeful, is it? I mean, listen to this summary again. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. <laughs> That's it. Is that it? Well, it turns out that's not the full story. There's a third accounting of creation. The first one talks about how things came to be. The second one talks about interrelationship between persons. And the third gives us the behind the scenes vision of what is going on, what was going on, what is going on, what will go on. And we find that in the first verses of the Gospel of John. And it begins this way. In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing has made that has been made. And many of you know we believe that behind this physical world is something even harder to understand than quantum physics, which is the Trinity, that there's one God and three persons. How can that be? I don't know. That is what is. And the Word is the Logos. The Word is the Logos, who is the Son of God, who existed before creation, and then later, later, steps down into space and time, takes on flesh, and walks this earth as Jesus the Christ. And that revelation says, this is not just one more religious guy. This is the one who was and is and shall be. He came down into space and time, this eternal one, this pre-existing one, Verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the world is still fallen. The world is still full of darkness and misery, but now there's a light within it, and that light is Jesus, the Christ. Dropping down to verse 10, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Gave the hand to the maker of heaven and earth. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. No thanks. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Oh my gosh. So we put all this together. What do we find? We find there is a maker of heaven and earth who is not part of the creation, but rather holds the creation in his hands. We find that the world was created and continues to unfold and move forward through time. But we also find that the Son of God existed before the world began, and he took on flesh and dwelt among us. What is the prophecy? The prophecy is that Genesis... Genesis tells us that because of sin, thorns and thistles, toil and struggle will be part of the human condition as long as there is an earth going out into the future. It's a declaration of the future. And from John, however, at the same time, to all who received the Son of Man, who believed he is who he said he was, to them would be given the right to become children of God. And this prophecy can be fulfilled in your life this very day. Like if you chose to receive Jesus into your heart right now as your Lord and Savior, imagine receiving a king into your house. Then you become this, and your life becomes an outpost for the kingdom of God. When I receive Jesus into my heart, he receives me into the family. I am adopted into the family. What a beautiful, beautiful truth. So here's the scoop. You guys might be like, I thought this was about revelation and prophecy. Well, I know that people love to talk about revelation and prophecies and the mysteries of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, and we, we get fascinated by the end times and the signs and the, the mark of the beast, and we're going to be talking about those things in the next two weeks. But if you asked me, what is the greatest revelation, the greatest prophecy, the one that is foundational, the one that actually changes the way you think about the world? Because there's a lot of people focused on all this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, well, what does that change about you, about the way you live life? This one changes the very way I understand life and understand myself. I believe it begins, this major foundational prophecy and revelation begins in Genesis chapter 
one. And here's the deal. Not only now does the world begin to make sense to me, when you receive Christ into your heart, it is a foretaste of the undoing of the fall of creation. We all are here together as children of Adam who can be saved and clothed in the glory of Christ. When I understand this, what it says is, I've become connected to, tethered, I've become tethered to the coming future when God makes a new heaven and a new earth and there is no more sorrow and no more tears and no more brokenness. I'm already connected to it. When we celebrate the Lord's table, this table is a declaration of some of the very things we've been talking about. It is a table that reminds me of a table 2,000 years ago when Jesus sat with his disciples for the Last Supper. It is a table that points to the end of days where there's the banquet of the feast, the banquet of the Lamb where we will sit down together. And it's a table right here, right now to remind us that God is present right here, right now. This act is a declaration that we are tethered to what Jesus did and we are tethered to what he is going to accomplish in the end. This beautiful act reminds us that he went to the cross for our sin and shame to pay for that. It reminds us also that he is the bread of life, that he offers us this new covenant. So let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Oh, Father God, how good it is that this world actually is within the story that you are telling, that my life is part of the story. Lord, how beautiful it is that we can participate together in your table, that we can remember not only what you have done, but what you will do that we not only taste what you've already done, but we get a foretaste of what you will do. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for a chance for new life. We know none of us are worthy to come to this table. We are all sinners. We are all fallen. But when we ask you into our lives, when we receive you as Lord and Savior, you clothe us in your righteousness. And so as we prepare to share this meal together, We begin by praying the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 